So, good afternoon, everybody here in the whole cell and also our Zoom audience. And welcome to the penultimate Heidelberg Joint Astronomical Colloquium this semester. Today, we're continuing with spectroscopy of galaxies, but at a rather different distance in the universe. And here to tell us all about it is Alison Strom. And I'll pass over to Eduardo Bandados to introduce Alison. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Professor Alison Strom. Uh, she did her PhD at Caltech, where she used a lot of Keck knives. So Alison is a spectroscopist. Uh, she has been observing with Keck, so one of the most powerful telescopes in the world for more than 60 nights. Very impressive. Then she moved on to a, a, a fellowship position at Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena, where she used, continue using uh, some of the biggest telescopes, the Magellan telescope. So she's basically been taking a lot of photons using the best telescopes in the North and the South. And then she moved for the second part of her fellowship to Princeton. Actually, we overlap in Carnegie, so that's where we met. Um, then the second part of her fellowship was in Princeton. And then she started to, to, to to plan the future spectroscopic facility for the Subaru telescope. So she's been involved in all these big facilities and also uh, not so long ago, she got awarded one of the, a really impressive JWC program called Cecilia. So I hope we can hear more about that program to, today. And recently uh, she became a professor at North, Northwestern University. So we're really looking forward to your talk. Please take it away. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Richard. Um, I am really delighted to be here today. Um, as Eduardo explained, I have a penchant for using very large, very expensive toys to look at things very, very far away. But I think we're actually on the cusp of a really exciting time in studying galaxies because of all of the advances over the last uh, couple of decades and looking ahead to the next couple of decades with facilities like JWST and the Subaru Prime Focus Spectrograph, which I'll tell you about later today. Um, and so that's what I mean by the new spectroscopic era. Now I often start this talk, but I couldn't find the slide, so I apologize, you'll have to imagine it, uh, with the Fraunhofer spectrum, the, the study of um, absorption lines in the solar spectrum because this was a real uh, transition time in the history of astronomy uh, in the history of astronomy another time when we went from maybe doing more of what people would consider just astronomy to doing more of what we consider to be astrophysics and so today rather than talking about the astrophysics of the sun and stars we're going to talk about the challenges that still exist in trying to understand the history of galaxies throughout cosmic time so taking a very big step back we have this sort of 14 billion year history of the universe. But most of what we know about galaxies is based on what they look like today. This is where we're able to study a large number of galaxies in great detail. And we know that they're highly diverse, a large range in masses, sizes, morphologies, um, and physical conditions. But it's not at all clear what leads galaxies to follow sometimes very different evolutionary pathways. And really the goal of galaxy formation evolution is to understand how individual galaxies go from their natal clouds and these nascent bubbles in the early universe all the way to the present day. But observationally and theoretically, there are a lot of challenges to forming um, this, this theory, this framework for understanding galaxy growth. And one is that we're talking about needing to understand a very large range of environments um, and physics. We not only need to worry about the physics of the gas, molecular clouds, star forming region, and dust in galaxies. We also have to worry about stars. So how are they forming? How are they undergoing nucleosynthesis and enriching the gas around them? How are they otherwise impacting their environments um, through supernovae and, and winds? And then finally, really on the largest scale, what about um, inflows and outflows at the interface between the cosmic web? And how are we thinking about um, how galaxies in different environments might be having um, different histories? So we need to worry about all of these constituent parts when we think about galaxies, but we also need to worry about the interplay between um, dark matter and baryons. 
So this is something um, that you probably have seen before, um, just a, a simulated volume with dark matter density on the left and gas color coded by gas temperature on the right. And, you know, there's this general appreciation that the overall physics of large scale structure is going to be determined by dark matter, which dominates um, the mass. But the few, the much smaller fraction of baryons in the gas also have a very large impact on their surroundings. And so you can see basically at the sites of where you find galaxies, these explosions where gas enriched hot gas from galaxies is being thrown out to very large volumes um, or very large distances. And so by the time that we start hitting um, closer to the present day, so we're now a few billion years in the past, almost, so intermediate redshift, you're going to see that material from galaxies and galaxies themselves have impacted almost this entire simulation volume. And so it's not enough to just understand the evolution of large scale structure uh, and structure development from dark matter. We also need to understand the baryonic um, physics and how the baryonic physics is perhaps interplaying um, with that structure. Okay, and then the final challenge is really a purely observational one. Um, which is that even though we can find and study galaxies a very long time ago, so galaxies during the epoch of reionization, and then a few billion years later during cosmic noon, and then all the way to today, so this is um, our neighbor Andromeda, we can never see a galaxy at more than one time in its history. And so even though what we want is a longitudinal understanding of galaxy formation evolution, what we get are cross sections. And so it would be like trying to understand human development if you had records and images of children in the 1900s, teenagers in the 1920s, um, and mature adults today. And somehow you have to know, okay, this is why this individual turned out different from this individual, but all you have are these historic photos. So this is this is sort of one of the additional challenges that we're confronted with um, in terms of observations. So when we ask what is the physics driving galaxy growth, uh, we have to do two things. We need to study individual galaxies in detail at individual times, so those cross-sectional analyses, and then we need to be able to link those studies together across cosmic time. And what I'm going to talk about for the rest of today is how galaxy chemistry helps us achieve both of those goals. Um, it helps us study galaxies in detail, but it's also really one of the key and only ways observationally to link galaxies um, between these different redshifts. So I'll start by talking about chemistry as a probe of galaxy assembly, move on to talking about sort of what we currently know about abundance patterns in distant galaxies, and then I'll end by talking about observational frontiers. Okay, so the universe starts with a lot of hydrogen and somewhat less helium, and then through the engines of transformation that are galaxies, um, and star formation in galaxies, we end up with still a lot of hydrogen, somewhat less helium, but now trace amounts of heavy elements like oxygen, carbon, iron, and nitrogen. Uh, and if you remember from your astronomy classes, this is sometimes referred to as X, the mass fraction of hydrogen, Y, the mass fraction of helium, and Z, the mass fraction of all other heavy elements, um, which chemists hate us for calling uh, metals. And so really when astronomers talk about metallicity, they could mean any one of those elements, but it derives from this um, original definition of the mass fraction of, of, of elements other than hydrogen and helium. So when we look at this um, metallicity versus some global galaxy property like stellar mass, and you see where galaxies fall, you'll see that they trace out a kind of um, locus, or maybe there's some scatter, but in general, as you're forming more stars, those stars are processing the hydrogen and helium into heavier elements, and you're going to increase the metallicity, the amount of metals in your gas. This is something that we call the mass metallicity relation, perhaps a little bit uh, uncreatively. But if we want to actually measure this, that's where it gets challenging. Um, but while there are many ways to measure metallicity, what I'm going to focus on today is emission line based metrics for determining the chemical enrichment of gas, uh, because this is one of the principal ways in which we're able to study galaxies and objects out to very large distances. These emission lines that originate in galaxy star forming regions are very, very bright and are one of the principal tracers of galaxies out um, to the epoch of reionization, as I'm sure you heard uh, last week. <laughs> 
So when we look at the signatures of the hot photoionized gas, we see a number of emission features, uh, both recombination lines of hydrogen, so H beta, H alpha, as well as collisionally excited lines of metallic ions like oxygen two, um, so doubly ionized oxygen, or single ionized oxygen, oxygen three, doubly ionized oxygen, nitrogen two, and sulfur two. Um, and we can use these to determine different quantities. So the flux in hydrogen recombination lines tells us about star formation rate by counting the number of ionizing photons. If we look at the emission from ions of the same element, um, but different ionization states, then we can learn about the sort of ionization conditions in gas. If you look at lines from the same ion, but with um, and similar excitation energies, but different critical densities, you can get the gas density. So this is the O2 and sulfur two doublets that you may um, be familiar with. And then critically for the rest of this talk is how we learn about electron temperature, which is by looking um, at emission from two levels of the same ion with different excitation energies. And so how does this relate to, to metallicity? Well, this is a level diagram um, for doubly ionized oxygen. Um, and just for the purposes of how we talk about this um, in observational astronomy, the emission from the first excited state to the ground state, these lines are often referred to as nebular lines. These are the very strong lines that you probably see referenced in many papers. But there's also emission from the second excited state to the first excited state. Well, I guess also to the ground state um, from the second excited state. And these are called auroral lines. And so um, in low density gas, each collision with a free electron essentially results in a, um, a population uh, to that level. And so then you sit around, you wait for the spontaneous de-excitation. And so the emission in these two different lines is going to roughly tell you the um, level populations, um, which is going to depend on electron temperature because it's a collisionally um, mediated process. Once you have the temperature, you can combine this with knowledge of the strength of the oxygen lines in the hydrogen recombination lines to determine um, the elemental, well, the ionic abundances. Um, and uh, this functions because one of the primary cooling pathways in photoionized gas are these low lying um, transitions from metallic ions. So because these oxygen atoms are the way in which the gas is cooling, we can correlate the emission from the oxygen atoms to the kinetic temperature in the gas um, and thus measure the metallicity. Unfortunately, this auroral line, which is so important for this very physically based method of determining um, oxygen abundance, is 100 times fainter than the bright lines that we typically see. So instead, we have to rely on ratios of the stronger uh, bright emission lines to infer abundances based on some calibration sample. So here is perhaps one of the most famous um, based on a sample of H local H2 regions and star forming galaxies and a couple of photoionization model points where you have this electron temperature based oxygen abundance, which can be measured in this small sample with very high quality observations now plotted against a ratio of these four stronger lines that can be routinely measured in much more diverse samples, including things that are metal rich or far away. And you'll see this uh, correlation, um, whereas this ratio increases, the oxygen abundance decreases. And so even if you don't have the TE measurement, you measure this very easy line ratio, you read off um, an electron temperature based oxygen abundance. But the problem is that this spread is physical. As you move to the left, basically around um, this locus, so the scatter to the left is going to be because the galaxy has more nitrogen at fixed oxygen abundance. Scatter to the right is going to be because it has more high, highly ionized gas at fixed oxygen abundance. And so because you don't necessarily know these things a priori in the sample that you're interested in studying, this can lead to systematic biases when you apply this kind of method to any sample that is potentially different from the calibration sample. So another way of thinking about this is that these empirical methods implicitly assume that your calibration sample and your sample of interest have the same abundance patterns, the same gas conditions, and the same massive stars, which is not necessarily true, especially when you think that most of these calibrations are based off of galaxies and H2 regions in the local universe. But now what we're trying to do is extend this 10, 12 billion years um, in the universe's past. Okay, but um, we know that these kinds of methods work very well 
for the calibration sample for populations like the calibration sample. And in fact, studies using these very sort of inexpensive strong line methods have led to some of the most important works um, in the history of extragalactic astronomy. And so um, about 20 years ago now, Tremonti et al. published an analysis of over 50,000 galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, looking at the trend between metallicity in this case, determined um, from a combination of lines and photoionization models um, and stellar mass, where you see this monotonic increase, with so more enriched galaxies as you move towards higher mass. Um, but where this differs and where it was surprising, perhaps, is that there's actually quite a large departure from this naive picture where you simply sort of increase, increase, increase um, uh, oxygen abundance sort of steadily as a function of stellar mass. And that's because what that simple picture that I introduced before didn't account for was gas flows in and out of galaxies. And in particular, the deviation here at low stellar masses, where the observations have a diminution in oxygen abundance at fixed stellar mass relative to this naive prediction, is because gas, enriched gas, so with oxygen, is being thrown out of galaxies. And this is occurring thanks to, in part, some of the same uh, mechanisms that we saw at play in the simulation earlier. And we also see abundant evidence for outflows in galaxies um, in the real universe as well. So by comparing the observed shape um, of the mass metallicity relation with predictions, we can provide constraints on the gas flows in and out of galaxies. And in particular, um, this is interpreted as low mass galaxies losing more of their oxygen than high mass galaxies, perhaps as a result of having shallower gravitational potential wells that make feedback from supernova and massive stars more efficient. So the mass metallicity relation is really a key piece of evidence that we have for knowing how feedback is impacting the growth of galaxies. It's really one of the only ways that we have uh, to constrain this observationally. But when we look at the present day universe and we look at the mass metallicity relation at redshift zero, what we're seeing is physics that has acted on galaxies in the past. It doesn't help us really understand the entirety of what caused those changes to happen. And so in order to get to the heart of this problem, we have to go and look at the time in the universe's history when most stars were formed. And so we know from analysis of the Lily Madau plot or the sort of trend in cosmic star formation rate density as a function of redshift, that over half of the stars in the universe were formed before a redshift of one. And the majority of these were formed in this broad peak between redshifts one and three, so 10 to 12 billion years ago. And in fact, this is what I spend most of my time thinking about. So if we replot um, this sort of time in the universe's history on this um, timeline uh, of, of the universe, you'll see that it actually corresponds to much of um, the time when galaxies start beginning to impact their environment significantly. And so this is a time that we really should focus on if we want to understand the origin of the diversity of the galaxy population today. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about abundance patterns in galaxies. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, I don't think see anything on Zoom. Okay. All right. So aside from the typical challenges in studying galaxy evolution, we are also now confronted with a practical challenge that all of these key metrics that tell us about the physics and galaxies and the, their chemical enrichment um, and properties are now no longer accessible to us observationally. So by a redshift of one, all of these emission lines have redshifted out of the optical bandpass. And then by redshift two, the entire rest optical spectrum is essentially in the near infrared. And while you might not think that this is a problem now, that we are living in the era of JWST, even 10 years ago, this was actually a huge problem. We didn't have sensitive multi-object near infrared spectrographs that could allow us to efficiently build up samples of rest optical spectra of high redshift galaxies. And so we were left to sort of do this piece by piece. But what changed about a decade ago was the advent of the most recent generation of uh, near-infrared multi-object spectrographs on ground-based telescopes, things like uh, MIRS on the MMT and formerly Magellan, MOSFIRE on Keck, um, and KMOS on the VLT. And in particular, what I worked on was a survey called the Keck Baryonic Structure Survey, which is a targeted spectroscopic survey of a uh, ridge of 1.5 to 3.5 galaxies in 15 fields centered on some of the brightest quasars in the sky. 
The idea is that we can do absorption line spectroscopy of the central quasar to learn about the gas around galaxies and then also learn in detail about the galaxies in the foreground. And my role was essentially to serve as the project scientist for the near infrared component of the survey. So I started my thesis around the same time MOSFIRE was commissioned and have been shepherding uh, this component of the survey uh, through ever since. This has led to about 60 nights of observations with Keck and about 1,500 galaxies with quality rest optical spectra um, in our target redshift range. I don't have time to talk about all of the results um, from KBSS. I'm mostly going to talk about um, here the chemical abundance scaling relations. Um, but if you're curious and you're bored about chemistry, there's plenty of other things that you can learn uh, about the high redshift universe from KBSS. I'm happy to talk to people afterwards. Or we're about to have the final data release. Um, and so if this is something that's interesting to you and you'd like to collaborate on a project, please let me know. Okay, so 10 years ago, um, actually even a couple years ago, these were great examples of rest optical spectra of redshift two galaxies. So here you have to do it piecemeal in the near infrared through the atmospheric transparency windows. So you have J band, um, H band, K band, but all the same lines. So the recombination lines of hydrogen, the collisionally excited lines of all of the metallic ions. Um, and this is just to sort of demonstrate the diversity of galaxies that we saw in our sample. But I think I, what I want you to keep in mind is that these are great spectra as of a couple years ago. So we're going to get there. The reveal is coming. But for now, <laughs> I'm actually going to show you how much we learned even from um, this, uh, this data set. It was transformative at the time. So um, if we look at the locus of galaxies um, in a parameter space where we plot some of these line ratios versus others. This is the BPT diagram, the baldwin phillips turlovich diagram that's used to separate um, star forming galaxies, which are on this part of the diagram from AGN. The details are unimportant, just know that um, basically the underlying correlations in star forming galaxies are what cause this very narrow locus and a change in the ionizing spectrum is what causes the fan up to the upper right. The very first look at Redshift 2 galaxies showed that they were actually pretty different. Um, but one could have argued that perhaps we were only catching the tail of the population, that this was biased, that we didn't really have a representative sample. But our work with KPSS showed that this wasn't true. It showed that basically the entire population of galaxies 10 billion years ago had, had very distinct nebular properties from galaxies today. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for this, um, but most importantly, what it means is that these empirical calibrations, so these four lines are these four lines. And if this is offset from the local calibration, so if the green points at redshift two are offset from the redshift zero points in gray, that means this is not going to work for redshift two galaxies because the redshift two locus is gonna fall in an entirely different place. So this meant going back to the drawing board, and so this is what I've been working on a lot for the last few years, um, and you may hear more about next week. I'm from Lisa Culey, who also works on photoionization models to understand galaxy spectra. Um, but this is a, a, a method that I refer to as GalDNA, um, which is sort of a reference to the fact that galaxy chemistry functions as a way of sort of linking galaxies with one another, as we'll see more later. But basically, I went back to what we already knew about galaxies. We knew some things about their hot stars. We knew some things about their gas. So we knew about the gas density in these galaxies um, from direct observations of that density sensor O2 line. We knew about star formation rates, so we could rule out um, the contributions from, say, shocks. We knew about the presence of AGN. We had rest UV spectra, and so we could say something about the expected um, enrichment and properties of the massive stars, which led us to choose models um, that included binarity. Um, from BPAS in particular, but we're now beginning to explore others. And then we fed all of this into a spectral synthesis um, model, so cloudy, um, which is going to track all of the ionization chemical on uh, thermal state of the gas and produce a model spectrum um, using these choices that are tuned to reproduce the observations of high redshift gal high galaxies. But in particular, what is not present in this framework is the implicit reliance on underlying correlations between abundances, uh, enrichment, and ionization conditions that plague strong line um, calibrations. So one of the first principal results from applying the GAL-DNA method to interpreting all of those KBSS spectra was that virtually all high-redshift galaxies have significantly 
um, enhance oxygen to iron ratios. They're alpha enhanced with respect to local galaxies. Um, and so what does this mean? Why should you care? Well, oxygen to iron is going to change the balance of heating and cooling in H2 regions because the iron is really driving the, um, the ionizing spectrum of the massive star. So it's really dictating the heating source um, in H2 regions and oxygen, as we've talked about before, is one of the primary cooling pathways. So as you change that balance between heating and cooling, you're going to have to change how you measure gas phase enrichment, how you uh, trace um, star formation rates with the same uh, observables, and even how you know to assign galaxies as point particles as tracers for large scale structure. Because even at the fixed appearance, um, very important things could be changing um, about the underlying galaxy population that you don't know because things appear the same way that they maybe do um, um, because of changes in oxygen time. But critically, even though this is kind of like maybe one step back, I felt like it was two steps forward because bulk, because abundance patterns can also contain a lot more information about the physics and the time scales of galaxy formation than just bulk metallicities. And so what do I mean by that? Well, it goes back to the origin of the elements. So this wonderful figure from Jennifer Johnson at OSU. But what I really want to focus on is just those two elements that we've been talking about. Oxygen, um, which is coming um, from core collapse supernovae on relatively short time scales, and iron, uh, the majority of which um, in galaxies is eventually coming on longer time scales from uh, type 1a supernovae. Um, and so if you are tracking these two elements with different formation timescales, they're kind of like a clock on the formation of galaxies. And so if we look at the ratio of those elements, oxygen formed on short timescales, iron formed on long timescales as a function of iron abundance relative to hydrogen, and you follow a single galaxy in this parameter space, it's going to do something like this, where at early times you have core collapse supernova yield, but then eventually, as type 1a began contributing to the enrichment of the ISM, you have more iron, and so this begins to decline. But uh, the details of this shape um, and where it falls and how a galaxy moves through this parameter space is essentially going to be sensitive to the details of recent star formation versus star formation on that time delay distribution for type 1as. So it's just a way of clocking star formation on the time scale of core collapse supernova star formation on the time scale of type 1As that are contributing to enrichment. So a very simple case, if you have a galaxy that forms a lot of stars very quickly before type 1As can turn on, you'll go out to higher iron abundance um, than a galaxy that forms more slowly. So in general, a high oxygen to iron ratio is going to reflect a more rapid assembly time scale than a low oxygen to iron ratio. Um, and we kind of see this in our own galaxy. So if we look at the location of different components of the Milky Way in this parameter space, you have high oxygen to iron, relatively low iron for the halo bulge and thick disk, whereas the thin disk is going to be on this declining part of the Wallerstein-Tinsley diagram. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about it that way, um, where the sun is relatively um, low oxygen to iron, reflecting its later formation in the Milky Way's history. Um, but what I think is actually really exciting about this and to really drive home the point of how uh, galaxy abundance patterns can link galaxies across cosmic time is if you now look at the Milky Way, so halo stars um, are these green triangles, thick disk stars um, are in green, so these sort of earlier forming components of the Milky Way, thin disk in blue, and you look at where we find high redshift galaxies to fall, you'll see that they have a lot in common with essentially the formation timescales and histories of the thick disk um, and uh, the halo. And we have a good reason to believe that the thick disk was forming around the same time um, as Redshift 2 galaxies. So one nice thing about the Gal DNA method, though, is it can be applied for individual galaxies. So I've been working with a graduate student at Princeton to compare uh, Milky Way components from Apogee. So that's the color-coded map in the back. Um, with individual galaxies from KBSS and trying to understand is there something different about the gal galaxies at Redshift 2 that already have abundance patterns more similar to the thin disk versus those that have abundance patterns more similar to the thick disk. So keep your eye open. I'm hoping that we'll have something out um, soon. Okay, 
So to come back, though, to our original probe, galaxy assembly and outflows and feedback, the mass metallicity relation, when we apply Gal DNA um, to this sample of galaxies at Redshift 2, where we've tried to circumvent all of these biases, we see something that looks perhaps a little bit unexpected. You have quite a large amount of scatter, and it's relatively shallow. But what's really exciting is we can now do this for multiple elements that are tracing multiple enrichment timescales. And so we can look at the enrichment pattern um, uh, in oxygen, we can look at it in iron. But these galaxies at Redshift 2 are maybe a few hundred million years old. And so really what we want is a time scale um, being traced that's more consistent with the time scale of interest for the formation of high redshift galaxies. And fortunately, Mother Nature has given us that in the form of nitrogen. Um, and although there remains some uncertainty about the nucleosynthetic origin of nitrogen in galaxies, um, it's generally thought to be formed on intermediate timescales coming from uh, planetary nebulae. And so this is exactly the kind of timescale that we would like to bridge the gap between the extremes of uh, oxygen in most iron in galaxies. And so we can look at this as well. Um, but lest the large amount of intrinsic scatter distract you, what I've done here is rescaled them all onto the same plot where the, sh the extent of the shading represents the intrinsic scatter in the relation. So the, uh, the relation on top in blue, the sort of short dash is oxygen. Um, the green in the middle, sort of the dot dash is iron. And on the bottom here at the left in red, the longer dashes is, is nitrogen. And basically you can read off immediately some interesting things about the galaxy population at cosmic noon. We know that the vertical offset is simply reflecting this large amount of alpha enhancement, so a characteristic um, oxygen to iron ratio of a few times solar. But what the similar slopes tell us between the oxygen relation and the iron relation, so the green and the blue, is that this alpha enhancement must persist out to even very high stellar masses in the high redshift universe, which means that even galaxies at you know, several times 10 to the 10, maybe even 10 to the 11, are actually consistent with having short rapid formation timescales. Um, in contrast, the steeper slope of nitrogen relative to the other two is showing um, that these galaxies must be still evolved enough that we've seen substantial enrichment from intermediate mass stars. And so this is kind of one way of thinking about the, the characteristic time scale of formation in galaxies um, during this period in cosmic history. The other thing that I would like to draw your attention to um, that I mentioned before mm -hmm. is the relatively shallow slope of the oxygen relation, which um, may indicate perhaps that there is less preferential mass loss in low mass galaxies relative to what we see in the low redshift universe. So from, uh, for example, Tremonti et al. Or perhaps this is instead reflective of sort of a, rather than some, a difference at the high or low mass end, more effective outflows in massive galaxies. It's really hard to say without um, a little bit more study and a larger dynamic range um, in stellar mass to sort of um, really confirm or refute the existence of the shallow slope. And the reason why I point that out is the, the shallow slope is actually pretty different um, from what other people find, both observationally um, and um, theoretically. And so here I'm showing two predicted uh, mass metallicity relations for oxygen abundance at redshift two, one from fire and one from a lustrous TNG. And basically the black points here and the gray points there are um, simulated galaxies, the colored points, the colored lines, and the colored points are observations. Um, and if you look at the Gal DNA relation, it's significantly shallower. Now, KBS has always had a shallower slope um, than other surveys, which we believe has to do with generally um, doing a better job recovering younger galaxies at all stellar masses. But you'll see that this is a pretty significant deviation from perhaps what is expected uh, from fire. And though e even though it might look consistent with the lower mass slope in Illustris, at the same stellar masses, it's actually pretty um, deviant. And so this is kind of a puzzle. How do we reconcile these observations, which have now tried to address the systematic biases that were present in these previous um, results, um, with the fact that simulations, who've worked hard to sort of recreate what we see in the universe, 
um, are showing something very different. So a, a puzzle, a puzzle for us to work on together. Um, but what I hope I've, I've shown you is that measuring abundance patterns is one way of sort of digging deeper into the physics of galaxy assembly than measuring just an overall uh, metallicity. And in the next five to 10 years, I'm really excited because new facilities are going to let us sort of continue to uh, improve how we measure enrichment and abundance patterns in higher shift galaxies, but also extend it to new populations where we've never been able to look at these kinds of measurements before. And so um, in the last uh, bit of the talk, I'm going to talk about sort of the things that I think are most exciting and in particular, some of the stuff that I'm working on. Um, okay. And so I think it would be remiss um, to talk about the new spectroscopic era without talking about one of the most powerful spectroscopic tools we have ever put um, in, uh, into operation, let alone in space. And that is the JWST um, observatory that was launched a little over a year ago and started operations last summer. Um, and I see um, really two principal use cases for JWST at the redshifts that we've been talking about during Cosmic Noon. One is to push the kinds of studies that I've been uh, telling you about to new parts of the population. Um, and this is what Mingyu Li did in a paper that was posted on the archive at the end of last year, where they looked at um, emission line spectra of lower mass galaxies than had been accessible from the ground. And what they saw was shallower mass metallicity relations at these stellar masses. And so if you look, oh, I guess this is supposed to be gray here. So 10 to the nine and above um, is essentially what we've been able to do from the ground. And so all of the colored points that go from 10 to the nine lower are what make it possible to um, really look um, for evidence of a shallower slope Oh yeah, sorry, I'm a big pointer. Um, differing from these steeper lines, which I also showed on a previous plot. Um, and so just to close the loop here, if we were to plot Cecilia, or sorry, this is not Cecilia, KBSS uh, from Gal DNA on this plot, it would have the same slope, slightly different normalization, but I tend to be less worried about normalization than I do about slope because of issues related to abundance scale, which I'm happy to talk more about later, but I don't want to bore anyone to tears. Um, so basically what I think this shows is that we, as we begin to extend the same kinds of analyses that we've begun to really work on getting more accurate and precise at higher stellar masses to lower stellar masses, not only are we potentially going to be able to tell the difference between uh, observational techniques, but we're also going to extend our ability to compare with simulations um, as they stand now. All right, so I got ahead of myself with Cecilia. Cecilia is instead, uh, I think, a prime example of the second use case that JWST has for galaxies at redshifts two to three, which is really ultra deep spectroscopy to go and get at faint lines that are just essentially impossible to get from the ground. And so Cecilia stands for chemical evolution constrained using ionized lines and in interstellar aurorae. Very proud of this acronym. I will never make up a better acronym. Um, and it was meant to be an homage to Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin, who, of course, in her uh, thesis about 100 years ago, revolutionized the way we thought about the chemical enrichment of stars, um, quite controversial at the time. Um, and the goal of Cecilia, the JWST program, which is led by my co-PI Gwen Rudy, staff scientist at Carnegie, and I, with the assistance of a couple of other emission line galaxy experts, including Mike Maceda, an alum of um, Heidelberg, um, is to help change the way that we think or at least feel confident about measurements of galaxy abundances in the early universe. So this has really been a heroic effort to use JWST as a tool to make these physically based um, abundance measurements in the high redshift universe across a representative sample for the first time. And so you know, if you remember from the very beginning that ideally you would make these electron temperature measurements and really firmly anchor your oxygen abundances in physics rather than as sort of based on all of these empirical um, assumptions about underlying correlations in the population. But again, this line is very, very weak. So this is a stack of redshift two galaxies from the ground. So this is not even just high quality ground-based spectra. This is about as good as you could ever hope to do from the ground. And basically it remains completely out of reach. 
And if you look at the predicted line fluxes um, for this auroral line as a function of oxygen abundance, where what we need to really recreate this is to extend all of these measurements out to even solar metallicity, that even in 30 hours with JWST, you're sort of not even confident you're going to get half the population, let alone at these high oxygen abundances where the alpha enhancement might be causing larger issues with systematic uncertainties. Um, and where we do have these measurements um, from the ground, they tend to be sort of atypical and restricted to a range in oxygen abundance that isn't particularly useful for assessing issues um, with existing empirical methods. So instead, what we did with Cecilia was go and target auroral emission lines at longer wavelengths, where JWST tends to be more sensitive, and where we also don't have to combat sort of a strengthening iron line, which sits in the wing of oxygen uh, 34363. And so in particular, we go after sulfur 3, 6312, and oxygen 2, 7320, 7330. This is an example from a local H2 region um, from the chaos survey. Great study. Uh, if you don't know about it, but mostly just meant to be sort of an atlas. And both of these lines for redshift two galaxies can be observed in a single configuration. And so we could drill very, very, very deep on a single uh, pointing with JWST and hope to get both of these lines for a representative sample of galaxies. And unlike the oxygen aurora line, the, uh, the line fluxes for these two auroral features, the sulfur three and the oxygen two, stay relatively bright across a large range of oxygen abundance um, and ionization parameter, which is captured sort of in the width of the, of the model loci. And so basically the goal is, you know, if we come back to this strong line calibration plot is to completely um, start over at high redshift and create a new diagnostic and new tools for measuring oxygen abundance in situ um, at high redshift. Okay, so now's the exciting part. You remember where I told you this is a great spectrum? This is actually a very nice spectrum. Um, but if we take the same spectrum and we plot on top of it a 30-hour spectrum from near spec, you'll see that things are dramatically different um, now that we have access to these kinds of data. So the um, black spectrum on the top is this gray background here. And the data from near spec from Cecilia is shown um, in green. So you'll see a dramatic reduction in noise, an ability to pick out some faint features. And so just to zoom in, this is the oxygen 2, 7320s, 7330 line um, for, this for this single galaxy, this specific galaxy. Um, and here is the region around 6312. So I think I forgot to draw in the zero line somewhere down here. But in when you do the full modeling of the spectrum, um, this is one of our most significant sulfur three line detections. You can see the peak separate from the oxygen one line at 6301 and the other oxygen one line, um, just a little bit longwards of that. Um, but these aren't the only things that we now have access to. So yes, we're going to be able to achieve our goal of recalibrating and assessing the robustness of enrichment indicators at redshift two, but we now have a wealth of faint emission line features that could be potentially telling us about a lot more having to do with the physics of galaxies. And I feel like I'm kind of a kid in a candy shop, but also like a student in class because I have to go back and learn again about what can we do in the high redshift universe that we have been doing um, in local galaxies in H2 regions for a long time. So this is basically the same plot now zoomed in so you can see some of the finer detail. Um, and so this is the, the complex with oxygen one and sulfur three. This is the oxygen two auroral feature. We have argon lines. We have other oxygen one lines. We have helium one lines. We actually have to absolutely fit a broad component under the, the bomber features. Otherwise, the, the fit fails, essentially, because the continuum is so well detected. Um, and here, you might not believe me, but I'm happy to show you afterwards. I think we even have a third auroral detection of nitrogen 2, 57, 55. So this, prob this may make this galaxy one of the only galaxies in the high redshift universe with multiple auroral line detections, which I think is super exciting. And I'm really looking forward to continuing to address some of the systematic issues with the data reduction that are um, sort of holding up my ability to give you more concrete results at this time. Um, but I have started working with some students at Northwestern. So Caroline von Reisfeld, who's a first year student, 
um, in my group is going to be investigating um, the Cecilia data and in particular thinking about how can we combine these observations with photo ionization models to leverage them to their maximum advantage. Okay, so I talked about what we're doing at the high end uh, or the more distant um, time in this period with KBSS and Cecilia. And in the last minute or so, I want to talk about the Subaru Prime Focus uh, spectrograph, which is a uh, instrument that will help us essentially track the rest of this key time um, in the universe's history. So what was happening after cosmic noon as galaxies began to diversify and have a really sort of varied distribution of star formation histories. So the Subaru Prime Focus Spectrograph is a massively multiplex fiber-fed spectrograph now being commissioned at the Subaru Telescope in Hawaii. It has 2,400 fibers across a degree field of view and a wavelength range going from about 3,800 angstroms to 1.25 microns, so bridging the observed optical and the observed near-infrared. We're going to have a dedicated 300-night um, survey over the next several years um, with three pillars, um, galaxy evolution, gal galactic archaeology, and cosmology. Around Thanksgiving last year, or maybe October, we had first light. And so this is from the red, uh, or the blue and the red modules. Each of these lines is a spectrum from the fiber. Um, and then around Thanksgiving, so I had very much to be grateful for indeed, we got one of the very first emission line spectra um, from the commissioning run. So this, there's a lot of things we haven't sorted out yet, um, but the fact that we're looking at this redshift uh, 0.85 galaxy in like an hour and a half or whatever, and already, you know, I think this is just very exciting. Proof of concept makes one very happy with a new ambitious um, instrument. But maybe you're like, okay, so you have some more galaxy spectra. What is this going to do for us? Um, I want you to remember or perhaps recall if um, you haven't thought about galaxies as, as much as some of your colleagues, how often you hear the Sloan Digital Sky Survey mentioned in conversations around understanding galaxy physics. So this was in part because it was a huge statistical survey that let us really basically transform the way we thought about investigating problems in galaxies. And uh, the Galaxy Evolution Survey with PFS and a similar survey that will be conducted with VLT moons in coming years will essentially be Sloan at Redshift 1. So this will be our opportunity to completely change the game in how we study galaxy populations six to nine billion years ago. It really occupies an unexplored region of parameter space in terms of number of objects and quality of spectra. So one of the principal challenges uh, to studying galaxies at these redshifts right now is the fact that we often have incomplete spectroscopic information. We don't have access to the whole rest optical uh, spectrum where all of those key diagnostic features are because some of them redshift out um, or, or there are, if you only look at the near infrared, then you don't have access to all of them. And so this is some early sort of pathfinder work I did with an undergraduate student at Princeton, now a graduate student in Arizona, Jake Helton, where we were trying to understand what was driving the empirical, um, evolution of galaxy spectra from 10 billion years ago. So you see green, nine, blue, um, six is redshift one, um, in purple all the way to the present day. And when you only have access to a few lines, it's actually incredibly hard to disentangle um, what exactly is causing um, this evolution and whether or not it is happening sort of, sort of at all stellar masses at the same time. When is it happening at different stellar masses? All of these are questions that will help us isolate the physical causes of these observed um, evolutionary trends. And so what we currently cannot say is, you know, are these changes because of gas enrichment or other physical uh, properties of the gas? Is it something about the mass of stars that is changing with cosmic time? Is it the mode of star formation? So sort of the clustering in terms of spatial or temporal um, star formation, or perhaps uh, changes in contributions from AGN. Jake Helton is now working on JWST with Marsha Riki, um, but I have been fortunate to um, recruit another um, graduate student at Northwestern, Natalie Jones, who's beginning um, to sort of take over and take the lead on some of this. Um, so I think, you know, in addition to being able to use these additional rest optical features to answer those questions, what I think it will allow us to do is also for the first time study galaxies across a wide range of redshifts with the same tools. 
So we've been studying galaxy evolution or in galaxy enrichment in the local universe with rest optical spectra for 20 years. We're now beginning to do this much better 10 to 12 billion years ago um, with near infrared spectra. And PFS in the next you know, uh, a few years is going to be telling us about what was happening in this key time period in between. And we'll finally have sort of the full story over the back you know, majority of the history of the universe. And I think this is incredibly exciting. Um, so to conclude, um, you know, I, I pose this question, what is the physics um, that drives galaxy growth? And while we, you know, are still trying to pinpoint the answer to that, um, it's really chemistry that's helping us track the, the physical or the physical origin of the observed changes in galaxies. And chemistry is how we're studying galaxies in detail at individual times. Um, and so I talked about Gal DNA, you know, the importance of measuring abundance patterns in order to understand galaxy assembly timescales. I talked about Cecilia as this sort of really, um, for lack of a better word, Rosetta Stone for interpreting galaxy spectroscopy in the early universe, you know, all the way out to the epoch of ionization, really. Um, but chemistry is also how we're connecting galaxies across cosmic time. So we can use it to even link higher shift galaxies to the Milky Way, as well as link all of these very large spectroscopic surveys with one another. And so I think this is a really exciting time. So if you've ever been curious about galaxy spectroscopy, now you, you shouldn't wait anymore. <laughs> because I think, you know, on the horizon are these really sort of game changing data sets. And there's going to be a lot to do. And it would be great to have more people working on the problem. Thanks, Alison. Uh, this is really interesting to see some of the physical implications of all these new measurements. Um, uh, as normal, we'll open the floor for questions. Thanks for this very nice uh, presentation and these exciting prospects of using James Webb and these other instruments as you know spectroscopic machines, so to say, mm -hmm. factories. Um, I'm wondering what actually you see, because galaxies do have a metallistic gradient, and I suppose uh, you see mostly the emission from the brightest spots, which is probably the galactic center, or some blobs distributed where you have local starbursts and so on and so forth. So how representative is that then for the bulk of the material, or is there some way to correct for metallistic gradients, for inhomogeneities in the galaxy, and so on and so forth? Uh, so that's a really good question. He was asking about the importance of metallicity gradients and other gradients and physical properties in biasing sort of these integrated light tracers. So you make a very good point. Basically, in these spectra that I've been showing, you're looking at a luminosity weighted average of all of the H2 regions. I would say that at a high redshift, it's not entirely clear that there are well-established gradients across the entire galaxy population. Where we've been able to do spatially resolved spectroscopy has often been limited to the most massive, most mature and evolved galaxies at high redshift. This is an, actually another area where James Webb will begin to look at more typical galaxies, um, but we'll really be able to assess this um, much more carefully in the era of the ELTs. I think I actually have a slide about this. Um, I mean, that we shouldn't have to wait. <laughs> so I think what we, we need to do, so like, so Manga is essentially the, the IFU add-on to Sloan, where you could look at maps, say, in oxygen abundance. And we're going to be able to do this um, in high redshift galaxies, even sort of relatively low mass high redshift galaxies pretty well with um, GMT or TMT. I apologize, I'm not very familiar with the ELT for slide instruments. Um, in the meantime, I think what we have to do is try and leverage as much as we can um, the better spatial resolution, say, of slitless spectroscopy with Webb to try and establish this. I have to say that at redshift two, I'm not particularly worried. I become more worried as we move towards lower redshifts with something like PFS. But there are a lot of other issues in terms of thinking about other sources of ionized line emission um, in those galaxies that we have to confront as well. So there's a, a push from some uh, groups working on simulations to try and forward model. Um, um, galaxy spectra. So I think this has been done um, by Dishkin Ryan's group with Simba, and I've been talking with some people in the FIRE collaboration. I think this is another way to potentially address um, some of these issues. Thank you for that intriguing talk. I, I was wondering about redundancies uh, between the different abundances, so the element abundance uh -huh. that you showed, and your physical interpretation. So uh, is there a lot of overlap in this, or 
you get these distinct stories for these distinct elements? Ah, so, you know, when I first presented oxygen and iron as having these very different time scales, um, you know, that's the general picture, right? That's how we think about abundances. I think, you know, people who work on galactic archaeology. But in fact, the fact that we see a constant slope for both um, oxygen and iron essentially across the entire sampled mass range. And they have very similar scatter, which is a probe of time scale. What I think that's telling us actually is that this iron is coming from the same source as the oxygen. Basically, we're not seeing very much iron enrichment from type 1As yet. We're only seeing it from core collapse supernovae. So in that sense, it is a little redundant, but it's interesting, right? Because if we'd seen something different, it would have told us more about the contribution from type 1As. Nitrogen, I think, um, despite some of its uncertainty about time scale, I think really is telling us that, you know, we, we are looking for some source of ISM enrichment that's operating on a longer time scale than core collapse supernovae. Um, if we could get something like carbon, which is a little bit more challenging, the carbon lines are weaker um, in the rest UV, I think that would be a nice addition as well. But a lot of these other features, so there's neon, there's sulfur, all of those lines are, don't give you additional information. And so even though we have um, probes, right, we have emission lines of those elements, they're not telling us anything new, I would say, relative to oxygen, because they're all kind of coming from the same, the same place. So you've got everything that you could possibly use. Uh, yeah, yeah, except for carbon. Yeah, we've basically scraped. We're, we're, we're trying to do the most we can. So I think by adding more emission lines at this point, what you're doing is actually, rather than constraining the enrichment of the gas, you're constraining more about the ionizing spectrum of the massive stars because each sort of ion has a different ionization potential and each, um, um, each line has a different... Um, requirement essentially for the kinetic energy in the gas. And so basically at this point, adding more lines gives you a more sensitive calorimeter <laughs> on the ionizing spectrum and less information, I would say, about the chemical enrichment of the gas. Um, but knowing more about the, the heating source lets you more confidently extract that chemical enrichment information. So it's it, it kind of, it's a positive feedback loop, I would say. Thanks, Alison. I wanted to ask about the um, direct electron temperature. Mm -hmm method, you kind of presented it as the, you know, the end of the story, the way to get a perfect uh, estimate or inference of the gas phase metallicity. But I, I wonder if there's some lurking systematics or theoretical uncertainty. So my question is really, when and, and how can the direct TE method go wrong? And is it perhaps dangerous to believe that it's giving you the truth? So I agree that it it's not as simple as we sometimes present this argument in telescope proposals. <laughs> um, and the reason for it is actually related to what I just um, said in the answer to the previous question, which is that um, really when you're interpreting these spectra, what you're looking at is something that reflects a balance of the heating mechanisms and the cooling mechanisms. And of course, if you're trying to understand the relationship between electron temperature, the temperature and the cooling mechanism, the oxygen abundance, you need to feel relatively confident about the heating, right? And so what we don't know, for example, is the distribution of ionizing photons from iron poor alpha enhanced massive stars. This is something that is not super well constrained. Different models have very different predictions for this. Um, so this is something that I'm very interested in trying to make progress on, um, working with um, stellar astronomers. But actually another issue um, that I didn't talk very much about at all is the fact that really what you're measuring are sort of ionic abundances and each ionization zone might have a different temperature. And so when you're measuring a temperature, say, of oxygen three versus oxygen two, you're actually measuring sort of properties of different, potentially different um, regions of gas. Um, and so in the local universe, a lot of this has been done by looking at samples where you have more than one electron temperature measurement. And so this is why having those samples with more than one electron temperature measurement that sampling different ionization zones could potentially help you um, understand ionization corrections and sort of the temperature structure of the nebula. Um, you know, I think Cecilia is one of the, we, 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 we designed it specifically to maximize the chances of getting multiple aurora line detections for sort of the widest range of oxygen abundances we could. Um, it's one of the deepest cycle one uh, programs being executed. And even so, it's like a sample of maybe, you know, 
we had 35 galaxies on the mask, maybe 20 with oxygen two detections, which is about what we expected. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we may need to borrow from a combination of local H2 region studies like chaos we might need to think a little bit more about detailed modeling, but you know, th there are ways in, in which it's, it's not just that we can take these measurements, plug it into the equations people have developed for local electron temperature stuff and kind of get going. I think we do really want to be careful so we don't introduce other, you know, systematic biases, let alone there's some issues with the abundance scale, but now I've gone on too long, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you've mentioned that inflows for uh, star forming galaxies that are nearby <clears throat> might be able to explain the steepening of the mass metallicity relation because the low mass end, while for higher redshift galaxies, the flattening might be explained by uh, the outflows that drive material out of the galaxies. Do you expect these outflows to be energetic and luminous enough uh, to be visible in the JWST spectra? Do you, in fact, see them? You mean like looking for broad components under emission lines? Yes. Uh, yeah. So I think I think this is potentially what we're seeing when we have to incorporate broad components under the... Um... Uh, bomber lines. Um, I think also what we have and sort of is unique for galaxies at Redshift 2 is the ability to trace outflows from the rest optical and the rest UV simultaneously, right? The rest UV spectra of these galaxies um, is accessible in the optical, um, so we don't have to go to space. Um, we already have um, relatively large samples of high quality rest UV spectra, including for Cecilia galaxies. And so, um, as well as many of the other sort of cycle one um, um, targeted spectroscopic samples. And so I think this is um, something that certainly uh, we will probably see more results on um, in the next year or so. So let's thank Alison for this very informative and interesting colloquium and good luck in your future work. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.